Hello, everybody. Welcome to our Catch Up Book Club live show for Sharp Ends by Joe Abercrombie. I do anticipate this one being a little bit of a shorter live show because I don't feel like we have many thoughts. It's a short book. It's a collection of short stories, but we will see what happens. Um, I want to thank my host for joining me today because as you will see, we have a couple of new faces. Um, I put an emergency call out on Instagram and Sandra and Deb came to, <laughs> came to rescue me and Zach from being on our own for this one. Um, so I think we'll kick off by, Deb, would you like to introduce yourself and I guess give a like general thoughts on the first law so far? All right. I'm Deb. I'm primarily on bookstagram at DG underscore reads. Um, I have had mixed feelings about First Law in general. I have some enjoyment as I'm reading things, but a lot of it is in one ear, out the other. And um, not going to say it's going to be a favorite series in the end, but I'm sticking it through. <laughs> Sandra? Uh, I'm Sandra. <laughs> Sorry, I'm like, what did I say? Uh, Some people I've, have seen Sandra before because of Wheel of Time along. So. Yes. <laughs> I'm from the channel God of Thing for Things. I feel like everyone has like their channel name and their name, but I don't like to write God of Thing for Things because it seems weird for some reason. <laughs> um, like It just seems like, what? Yeah, you know, either way. <laughs> Uh, I uh, I always wanted to read a series and I had already read the first book when you started this read along. And I was like, wow, now I have an excuse to continue. I didn't really like the first one and now I haven't I haven't liked any of the books. Really. Wow. Wow. <laughs> like I rated them all like two stars. I like how everyone's kind of mid, but everyone is still reading. I mean, yeah. that's... <laughs> and then I was like, I told, because I would like start to unhold books and I was like, I would unhold these if they weren't considered classic fantasy and that I would probably would maybe want to reread them in like 10 years. But mm -hmm. if they weren't as popular, I would probably get rid of them because I haven't liked a single one. Wow. For for me, I'm struggling because I, I texted you earlier and said that I haven't bought the newest Wheel of Time book that we're on yet. And it's like, I was going to get it from the library, but at this point, because the read-along takes up so much time, I don't want to unhaul the books because I did like a whole read-along that like takes two years. Um, but I feel like I would also potentially, I have liked, like, I would definitely get rid of the standalones and the short story collection if I unhauled, like, the first law books. And maybe keep, I don't know about the second trilogy yet, but I'd keep the first trilogy, I think. But I feel yeah. you. I liked, like, parts of it. They're, like, scenes I enjoy. But most of I just feel like, like Dab said, like, I read it and it just goes out the other air. And I, I cannot recall a single thing that happened in Heroes and Red Country. Oh, see, I don't really remember anything in <laughs> Best of Cold, but Heroes and Red Country, like, I do remember. I find it so funny that you say Best of Cold when I'm I'm out here like, that's my favourite one. That is, like, the one out of everything we've read so far that I'm like, this is this is the good one. I am... Um... Oh, right, before I get into this, because this, I guess, is a point about sharp pens. Zaf, what was your feeling about the short story collection? Like, in general? <clears throat> So I thought it dragged heavily. I didn't think as many of the perspectives were as interesting as they thought they were, though I think they would have had significantly more merit if they actually took place in the books and the times where they should have taken place as opposed to this like long mishmash where you have to do these massive leaps. And obviously at this point, like the books would have been released year after year. And at this point, like, again, we have like quite a few months between each book. You are going to forget names and they introduce people way too quickly and this is just a thing that Joe Abercrombie does a lot. And I don't like you don't get time to remember who someone was. Um, and like the uh, first law wiki failed me because clearly they couldn't be bothered to update even the character list of who was in this. And I was like, God damn, I forgot all these characters. I, I'm just going to try and remember as I'm going through. I was just like, it just dragged way too much. Though I have to say, overall, should we do ratings? Are we doing ratings now? Yeah, yeah, sure. Okay, so this was a 3 out of 5 for me, and that's a very generous 3 out of 5. It's more so a 2.5 out of 5, to be honest. Um, but the main thing I really, really loved was the relationship between Shev and Jazre or Jasri. I loved their chapters. If the book was just them, uh, it would be significantly higher rating. But it was just, like, bogged down by all this other mess that we... I, don't, I did not care for all these extra perspectives. That, um, yeah, it just went 
all the way down for me. The, the last chapter, we can get to that later. That was that was interesting. Um, I kind of I was going to save my thoughts until I, I've given everybody else the opportunity to talk about the short story collection, but I think it's very interesting because my least favorite parts of it was the continuing story of is it Chev? Shrev, Chev, Chev, and I say Havre because I assume it's Spanish, but I don't know if it is. <laughs> so I have no idea. And I didn't listen to the audio, but I feel like they were just to add a little bit of continuity into the short story collection. But I didn't care enough about them to actually care what they were doing. I'm wondering if the fact that the other girl, the blonde girl, has the item. Karklo, Karaklus, what the fuck was Karkov that? Karkov or something? <laughs> Karkov? Um, I'm wondering if the fact that she has this thing that was stolen from a wizard is going to be relevant going into the next trilogy. And that was pretty much the only point of actually reading this. But generally I do think that it wouldn't have been terrible to have skipped the short story collection. I did enjoy... I really liked two, but I also liked the Glockta one at the beginning as well but I feel that didn't really have a point which is why it's not one of my favorites and classes the one that I like but I did like kind of enjoy that one and I think it was interesting that Joe Abercrombie put that one first because I feel like it kind of hooks you in and then it falls flat like from that point it, um, it, it doesn't really achieve anything but I do think seeing him in his prime is so interesting because it parallels so nicely with what he turns into especially how he treats Ruse mm. Uh, Deb, what do you think in general about the short story collection? Oh, my rating was two stars, by the way. I gave it 2.5, um, rounded down to two for Goodreads purposes. Um, I felt the same, like the Glock, the story, I enjoyed that at the beginning. Um, and then I lost track. I liked the Chev and however we're pronouncing his name, I did the audio and I still can't remember. Mm -hmm. um, I did like those stories and I actually went and did a little bit of research to try to figure out, are these characters I should know? Um, are these characters who seem like they'll be important in the future? It didn't seem like it. So I'm curious how that's going to tie into the next trilogy. Mm -hmm. Sandra? Um, I didn't know who anyone was ex except Glock and Logan, obviously. <laughs> and I was like, am I supposed to care about any of this? That is like, does, does it have any relevance to anything? Not that I feel like the first trilogy even had a relevance to itself. Like, it's just, I mean, <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> so like, so like, I was just sitting there like, okay, great. But like, I liked like some, like, like, like you said, the relationship between Chev and like, the continuous we had but then I was also like does it matter I, I agree with that whole thing of like yeah. putting Glockta first and then um, Logan at the end to sandwich it so it reminds you that you're there and I did I did appreciate I think it was um, shy as well as like references to what Mons is up to and like seeing that dumb chapter of Koska like Nicola Koska like oh. sure it tied in but I just I don't care I kind of don't care about these little things <laughs> it felt very much and I don't know the circumstances to this being published but it felt very much you know when you get like a bonus throwaway book that's like here's a bind up of all of these random novellas that would have been published in magazines or would have been like free ebooks or something like that um one of my favorite ones as well was actually this so uh, my favorite one was the one at the end and then this one which was called is it wrong time wrong place and it was three different people that just happened to be around when big things were happening during the standalones and kind of ended up just being collateral damage and i thought that that was cool um but aside from those three it was a bit of a miss for me really i think that the something i had an issue with the shove storyline as well because the last time we see Chev is when she's leaving I'm sure she's called Kharkov and we see her leave Kharkov and then she comes back and we go through this big circle of this item being stolen and passed around and then Chev gives it to Kharkov at the end but I feel like how did we get back to Chev and Kharkov when she'd already left it seemed like she was abandoning Kharkov or whatever the fuck her name is and then, and then exactly Exactly, and then Havre finally gets it and she's finally going to have her freedom, but then she helps her ex-lover anyway. I felt like 
all of that development for what? Like, what was the reason? Yeah, because as well as, like, obviously we know that Joe Abercrombie books do come full circle and always end kind of hopelessly, we missed a massive chunk there where it just jumped from her making the decision to leave Kharkov to just, like, oh, look, she gives it back to her in the end. And I guess kind of the point between those two is that Chev always comes back to her even though she knows that she's no good for her. But I feel like we did lack a chapter in that because I was I, we missed the part where Chev went to Havre and kind of like started like d helping her before she went back to Kharkov that I feel like we really missed but were they gay or was it just me but they are lesbians they're both yeah, gay. okay yeah, yeah, because yeah. I'm never sure over these uh, <laughs> I, 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 to be honest I think thinking about it I think the reason why a lot of us probably enjoyed Chev's chapters or didn't enjoy them was because they were new and I think it, it was so much easier to fall into their storyline compared to like trying to remember all these characters that like somewhat seem familiar and these names are always somewhat similar to one another um it was just so much easier because it was just like a completely new story in, in spaces that we already know though I think Avercrombie does a thing where he kind of parallels a lot of names because like you have Severod but then you have Chev and like all of these names can sometimes like sound similar I don't know if he does it like on purpose or what but I thought that was kind of interesting as if he's trying to draw parallels even with names or if it's meant to be like an indicator or a culture like that they mm -hmm. sound kind of similar um have we seen Chev before because Chev is with Monza at one point but I don't, I don't remember a lot of that book, so I can't remember if Chev was actually a key part of that. I don't, I literally don't remember her there either. The, wiki, I think. the wikis seem to imply no that these are new characters, but they also could just be missing information too. Because so, mm -hmm. I, I felt like I should have known them or known Chev more, but research didn't help with that. Like they refer to Chev as like the best thief in the world, circle of the world so I'm assuming like she must have gained so much renown to the point where she was kind of employed by those around Monza and that's why we see when it is Monza has her power like her son is quite a few years old and we haven't been around her for the past few books so we don't really like know what's going on with her so I think it's meant to imply that oh they have some kind of they're like they are aware of each other in some realm um, and kind of introducing that before the next trilogy comes out I think the way that Chev and Monza were together in that story implied that we knew who Chev was and why Chev would be with Monza, even though we don't. And I think that's the issue that I had. I thought that I'd forgotten something because it's just like so casual how they're already there. And like Severard, I think, is also there. Um, people and like people who we'd seen with Monza, like the last time we saw Monza. So I thought that I, because like we've read a lot of books at this point, they are spaced out a little bit. There's so many side characters. And I think the way that he put that together was very much like, I felt like I should know who Chev was. But I think, where is the comment? The Chev storyline could have been a decent novella, but it was a lackluster hodgepodge of short stories instead. And I think that that pretty much like nails it on the head. Like, it could have been a collection of short stories as it was with the Chev and Havre storyline like spread out with others in between but with more continuity between these stories so that you're actually kind of looking forward to the next chapter of their adventure instead of it skipping like many years I feel um, and I feel like that's the reason why they're included to make you like to make it have a point but I don't feel like it was a hit. Because I know a lot of these stories, or at least a good chunk of them, were um, pub previously published. So I wonder if maybe in order to make a collection, if the the Chev chapters were maybe, or stories were maybe the new additions to kind of make it into something new. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Do you feel like if you just hadn't read this, that you would have missed anything? I mean, I do feel like the item that they've stolen is relevant because that seems to be what we're building up to. But I don't feel like we would have missed knowing about it if we hadn't read this. I feel like we would have been fine. It could have been a prologue in the next book or yeah. there could have been some inclusion there. <laughs> 
I mean, I think even maybe the artifact could be relevant to the trilogy, but Shevin, like Havre and Karkov are potentially not. Yeah. And that was just like a little if you know, you know, kind of situation that doesn't actually really matter. Um I think for me it's because I know we've we've discussed very briefly at the beginning, I said I wanted to come back to it. We discussed whether about the short story not the short stories, the standalones versus the trilogy. And some people prefer the standalones. I prefer the series. But something that I thought was very interesting, because I thought at this point where I haven't really loved the last three books, like I don't like Best Served Cold, The Heroes and Red Country were good, but not amazing for me. Um, I thought that it was because it's like so many books back to back that I'm not I just don't really enjoy Joe Abercrombie but then we got to the last story in here and it felt very different to the rest of the stories and it felt very much like the trilogy and I'm like no okay it isn't me these are very very different and I feel like when you're reading them with like space between you kind of don't notice how different they are but having that story at the end of this collection was like no it is actually there's just something very very different about it um and I wanted to know whether you guys both kind of agree with me that there is a difference and also whether you prefer the standalones or the trilogy. I agree though, like when we came to the last story, like it, it reminded me of the trilogy again, like the parts I liked of that. Mm -hmm. But now since reading the trilogy, I just feel like I can't trust him, like the author to like bring it all together for it to make sense. Cause like we just, I felt like the trilogy is under the nowhere. And I was like, I read all this for what? <laughs> so I, I literally completely agree. And I do think that... I feel like the last story could have been an epilogue or something where, like, Bethlehem is reminiscing about what happened with Logan after, like, one of the books in the original trilogy because it would have hit so much harder after meeting Logan. And he is just, like... he was He's such a different character to who he used to be. Like, I was so surprised that they, they're associating that behavior with the name Logan because of everything we've seen of him. We know he can be an incredibly brutalistic killer. However, we've never seen him have that kind of personality where he's just so volatile and kind of, like, arrogant and, like, quick to... Like, he's basically like a moody teenager. I don't know how to explain it. A teenager with too much power. And I was just like, damn, like, I, I would have loved to see that after we'd explored that original trilogy, because everyone kind of talking about how messed up he was, but we never saw it. And then just like, oh, the whole thing with like Death Lord going into the cage and seeing the remains of uh, what's his face's son like everywhere, and then him playing with the head. I was just like, oh, I love this. This is delicious. No, 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 no. Obviously, not numbing his body parts, but I'm just saying, like, the chapter was like, no, 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 I was having a great time. Oh, like, this is, this is peak. I wish there was more of this. And like, from Grimdahl, I kind of expected more of those like really horrifying, really unnerving uh, moments. And I don't feel like we've actually had them. The grimdark seems to be just this general level of depression and everything is futile as opposed to actually dark. And that's where we finally saw it at the end of this book. So just a real world then. Just like the general depression. <laughs> you wanted it darker. <laughs> we didn't even get that. I want to fact check something. Is the guy that Logan kills is that Shiva's brother? Uh, yes, because that's how yes. that's right. It was right. No, 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 that was uh, it, Shiva's is Bethel's son, no? No, Shiva's crop, no, scale and yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. No, yeah, sorry, misunderstanding. Um, so you're saying he's Rattlenecks, yeah, son. Son. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And somebody in the um, chat will probably be able to confirm that for sure. But when um, Rattleneck's like name kept coming up over and over again, I was like, I'm sure that I've I definitely know that name, and I wonder if it's because it's Shivers is dad. Um, yeah. So that's why. See, this is the thing because that one is like super relevant to like tons of stuff because the Shivers storyline keeps cropping up, like in every pretty much every book apart from I don't think is it the heroes that he isn't in. So like that keeps coming up over and over again and we finally got a glimpse back at that. I do have a kind of a criticism about it. It does make sense. But the Logan that we see in this short story is obviously a very different Logan that we know. And we know Logan at different points in his life. And I felt like 
it didn't feel like Logan at all for me, which I understand is the point because the whole point is that Logan was like such a horrible person and did all of these horrible things and now he's had like an epiphany and he wants to like change a little bit. But I feel like because we had no connection with Logan in the in-between, it felt like a very much like this isn't even the same kind of character, which like it does make sense, but also it's very jarring to me. Did you also feel like that with Shivers though? Because to me, it's kind of like their stories are obviously very parallel. One kind of was crazy and then tried to do a normal good thing. One was like living through his life, went through something, feels like he has to do something and then went crazy. So it's like they have this kind of parallel, but it seems at the end of, I think it was Red Country, where they both just were like over it. They were just over the situation. Um, Though Logan still deciding to go back and leave is still very weird to me, considering his entire arc felt like he was trying to leave whatever this is behind. And mm-hmm. I think Abercrombie is trying to remind us of this is like, we, we've seen Logan lovely. Let's pretend it's like a lovely Logan. Um, and then we've now seen Logan depraved. Like, I'm so curious as to nece- like what is going to happen to Logan when he goes back to the North, because he's still got a lot of enemies there, even if Shivers is over him. Also, doggy! <laughs> <laughs> I am hoping that... Um... Logan is coming back. I don't know if Joe Abercrombie's gonna like really make us wait for it like he did with Logan in the first place, like after Logan went missing. Um, what was the turning point for Logan? Because I know that his family was killed. Was that the turning point, or did it happen before that? Because he was obviously this bloodthirsty killer, and then he had like a change of heart, and I know that he had a family and his family died. I can't remember if it was that that kind of changed his mind. I also have to wonder, like, how the spirits that he could talk to play into this, because I cannot imagine in any world where the spirits would want to talk to the kind of person he was. Oh, I forgot as well that he, because he has the most magic in the first trilogy, like, where that's where we're introduced to magic with him. Exactly. So I'm, I just cannot comprehend the spirits being like, this crazy guy who likes to strew around guts, he's the one we're going to talk to. We feel comfortable around. I I don't imagine that happening. And also, I'm imagining the spirits kind of looking like spirited away. No, no, not sorry. Anyway. We don't want to be like one of those anime Ghibli, like, low. Yeah. <laughs> like, I don't think they'd be round Logan, who's just so depraved um, yeah. at this point. And it's that's why it's just like very, very jarring. See, like, because I, I see what you mean in the sense that we can't imagine a character like that having any kind of resonance with the spirits or anything like that. But yeah. also, I think we start the books with him having like a rebirth moment. Like when he literally like yes. falls off the cliff and thinks everyone he knows is dead, and that's that that absolute drastic situation where he's so alone, and then also has the opportunity to reinvent himself is what kind of pushes him to actually just like start from scratch and be someone else. I love that this the standalones are actually the Shivers trilogy. <laughs> um, I think because like as I've said, we do start with like a rebirth moment for Logan, but like. The Logan that we know is weary and he's like tired of everything that's kind of happened and kind of wants to change even though he ultimately doesn't really know how to do it and I feel like the Logan that we met in this short story is very far away from that Logan. No, that was a stupid like question. Like that was a he... question. Have you seen Logan since the original trilogy and this story? Yeah. Did I miss? Did oh I miss God, it? Sandra. How did you miss it? Because <laughs> I've been so in out. Because I've been bored. He's in We're... um. What's the last standalone? That Red we Country. Red Country. Oh my yeah. God! He's in all of it. You see what happened? He's he's Shy's dad. So like, like, but we don't, they don't say his name. Yeah, they don't say his name is the thing. So like, you either know it's Logan or you don't. And I understand how if you had zoned out, you would have missed it because I missed. It. Yeah, <laughs> we kind of really get to a point where like he alludes to being Logan, but no, no point does he ever actually say it. Oh well, I did not get it. Apparently, <laughs> that's well, now you know. that's description of him being the weary person is Sandra's reading of Logan's story. Yeah. <laughs> Is weary and in one year. Andra is weary of reading about Logan. <laughs> yeah. No, I missed him. I was just like, is he alive? Did he die? Where is he? Like, because he fell into the river in the last page of the third book, right? So, just... recap for Sandra, he turned up in the Red Country and ended up on a farm where he was helping out Shai's mother and ended up being like her kind of stepfather. So, when she goes off on this mission, 
He's with her the entire time. And she knows him as somebody who would never hurt anybody who isn't assertive, who is kind of dumb. And he ends up turning into Logan and going like a rampage. <laughs> and she's kind of shook. And then right at the end, Shivers finds him and just kind of looks at him and is like, you know what, I'm over it. And then tells Logan that he can stay there and like live his life. And then Logan gets up and leaves. But this, I don't so get... this last story, is this before? This is before the trilogy. The last story, yeah. So the last story is before he, before the first book starts. Yes, that's what I thought. Okay. okay. Yeah, Timeline is really when she showed up at the end. Uh, <laughs> in Red Country. I don't remember. <laughs> the dude with the two eyes. Two months ago. <laughs> Oh my goodness. Oh, shivers. Someone give backstory. Oh, Sandra. Uh, he's the guy who bangs Monza and then, like, wants to kill her. And, like, he's the son of Rattleneck and, like, originally wanted to kill Logan. But then he was like, actually, F this shit. I'm just going to try and be a good guy. Then he was kind of done to be a good Logan guy. In the back and he has many chances to take his revenge and then he doesn't. Yeah, he's just kooky. He's a, he's a kooky little guy. A kooky little guy, apart from he's actually like seven foot tall and a beast. <laughs> What's he gonna do? Stare at me to death. <laughs> yes, Andrew, did you read Red Country? I, I read it. Did I read it well? That when is did you question. read it? It was a while ago, wasn't it? Yeah. Also, like, reading and absorbing the information are two very different things. Because I'm going to be real with you, Chief. I did not absorb as much information from these short stories as I wish I did. I think for me, Red Country as well, I we talked about it in the last live show, but all of the bits that were about Costca, I absorbed nothing. And then when it got to Shy being like the main part of the story is where I actually like was paying attention. But I think it's even illustrated in the short story collection with the difference between like the bulk of the stories and the last one is that he ha does have like kind of a different writing style. And I think when he writes action, I kind of switch off. This is something that doesn't make sense to me, sorry, real quick. Because Becca hates action scenes, so I'm like, why did you choose this series? Because they just <laughs> love to keep doing this. I did not choose this series. Cody chose this series, and I didn't, I hadn't sampled it. I hadn't read anything from it. Because, like, never Where is Cody? Grimdark. Mark <laughs> Florence is grimdark, but they're not, like, hundreds of action scenes. I read the Red Country, apparently, in December. No memories of this happening. Sounds Red, fake to me. In, oh, December's not that long ago. I thought it was ages ago, but it's not. It is long. It was like three months ago. <laughs> Isn't I read that it last book we read. It's <laughs> like the seventeenth of December. I read it. That's exactly three months ago to this day. It was the last book that we read, but we would have read it in like January. So we it's a little bit fresher for us. Um. Yeah, I think the monster's child is shivers because I know that they say that she keeps saying that it's related to the Duke, but they don't believe that the baby's related to the Duke. And she kills so. anyone who opposes her anyway, so who's going to say shit? Um. Oh my god, yes. Uh, as Anna said, like, the biography about Cosca, like, dude, I just wanted, like, again, no information absorbing in my brain. I wanted to bash myself over the head. The, I won't lie, though, that bit at the end, where he's just like, get rid of anything about that, like, dude who wrote stuff, I forgot what word he used. Um, but basically, like, the shout out to basically saying get rid of anything to do with Temple, because he clearly feels, like, really, really betrayed. Mm -hmm. He's such a loser. Like, Nicola <laughs> Cosmo is just such a loser. Like, I loved him originally, but now I just literally think he's so pretentious and annoying. I can't stand him. I really hope he, like, just shuts up. <laughs> I don't know. I liked him in... Which book is it where Glockta goes to the city? Is it Dagoska? Isn't that like the second book or something? Yeah, I liked him in that book. Um, <laughs> I liked ages him. Ago. What? That was ages ago. Yeah, I know. I liked him in that book. And I liked him in book three. And then since he's come back, he's kind of like, I've realised that I just don't like the way that he's written because there's like a flamboyance in it. And it's just not a writing style that I enjoy, I feel. Does anyone feel like this was like, in a way, uh, a collection of fan fiction where the author was just like flexing his writing muscles to write a bunch of different kinds of characters and personalities and stories that he stereotypically would not be able to write in his normal series? Because that's kind of how I felt. Definitely, and it didn't like, even have a cringy sex scene. 
Oh, oh, well, we almost. Wait, no, no, at the end. We we did kind oh, of have, like, shit. the echoes of a. Yeah. With Logan. The slapping. Yeah. Of unwashed meat. <laughs> mm. He loves doing that, though, doesn't he? Because I remember him doing that with Pharaoh as well. Like, maybe he likes them musty. I don't know. Oh, no, we actually had two. We had two sex scenes. They just weren't, like, vividly told to you. Because remember when um, big, like, redhead Javre was like banging Wirren and poor Chev had to just listen to it and like I'm sorry what were the sound effects because the uh, 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 I can get that what is the what is that like what noise is Wirren making because he kept doing that do you not remember this Mecca? like I was just like what <laughs> um maybe the person is like vibrating I feel like I did <laughs> no I feel like I, I do actually remember that and I kind of just was like I just glossed right over it because I was like don't want to know because every time we get to a job a crumby sex scene I'm like okay let's just not because like, I know I skipped yeah, some I of skipped. them <laughs> I hope the audio winner I got paid well. I'm, I'm gonna go and try to find the audiobook just to hear what that noise was gonna be <laughs> you, know, um, you know it's like a vibration you know <laughs> Who's yeah, vibrating? Yeah. Like, stop. <laughs> well, that's what Sandra said. Yes. And that's the magic in this world. Yeah, you yeah. wanted more fantasy. <laughs> Was it Shivers back with Monza in one of the short stories here? I will confess that the short story that had Monza in it was one of my least favourites, so I cannot answer this question. I don't remember seeing Shivers. I didn't pick up on it if it was honestly but i mean if she was hooking a guy with a metal eye then potentially i would say that, that is likely i'm sorry this is so rude if, if that happened i'd be so angry because i i said previously that i wanted to see them reunite and just like see what would happen because mm -hmm. like it just looks like an entire shit show like this is like I hate each other at this point, though, right so like it would be weird like they try to kill each other i i want to know if they ever come across each other what it would be like because their relationship just dissolved into like essentially hatred and resentment. So it's not something easily to come back from, I feel, but I'm gonna have to go back and like fact check that. Less grimaces, I keep forgetting that this is a thing which is good because then I won't notice it. Oh, it was a flashback from the final battle in Best Serve Cold. Mm. Wrong place, wrong time. Okay, I was just vibing with... I think I struggled to place a lot of the exact incidences that wrong place, wrong time happened during. I remember the brothel one for sure. So I feel like I was spent most of my brain power trying to figure out what <laughs> um, like incident the stories were happening during for this. But yeah, if it's a flashback, then that would make sense. So for like a reread, you should read these when you know they're happening. I think, do we, right, because I was very lazy and I could have gone to my bookshelf and looked, do we know when we are reading the other books what year they take place? Like, do they tell us? Because now this has, like, all of the years and I, one of my main criticisms of this actually is I feel like instead of saying what year it is, it would say, like, this happens between Best of Cold and the Heroes. Yes, agreed. Because, like, I'm not in this world. I don't know what year anything happened. And I feel like, I mean, arguably, we should have done that work for a book club, but the casual reader is not doing that work. So it feels like a lot of effort, like a lot to ask of somebody. So we didn't fail, basically, is the more important thing. We didn't fail. <laughs> we're, we're just experiencing it like the average reader would. Yeah, we are. This book club is about the average reader. <laughs> And the average reader's experience. The average reader would have quit like a long time ago. <laughs> Valid. That's why you needed replacements. Guess they all did. No. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah, I feel like uh -huh. the author really expects the reader to know his world as well as he does. Almost. I do like, think that pick up those subtle things and you know the one-liner. Oh yeah, you're supposed to connect that to this character, and I don't know the world that well. I'm like, I'm not that smart. If you're reading these when they're being published, you're not retaining that information for sure. Yeah. Yeah, but they're like those super fans. They probably read it like 14 times. I will say day. though, Faye has a mind of steel because Faye seems to be remembering everything that happened and earlier um, she said that she read it six years ago. So that's impressive. 
Yeah. <laughs> Better than me, way better than me. One thing uh, that also goes through my head is it doesn't really feel like the areas in the book feel as distinguishable as you would hope. And maybe again, it's just like I'm not retaining as much information as I should be. But usually, I'm really, really good at remembering like what different places look like, etc. Um, but the, the I feel like my brain is just thinking there is a desert place to the east. There is also a deserty place to the west. It is cold in the north it's wet in the middle that's it that's where my brain goes like i, I don't know what how, what the weather in sapani is like etc cetera, etc cetera. like i'm not retaining those pieces of information as well because it is so character focused which is fine but it's like if you're going to make so much about your characters and how they are related to the places that they are your place the places that they're in should feel more distinguishable i don't actually see much difference between people from one place to another apart from like the Northmen and everyone else and they carry on making that distinction and that in turn makes the world feel significantly more simplistic than I would actually hope for. I think you also hit the nail on the head that right at the beginning of the live show where you said something that we've said many times before which is that he introduces characters so quickly which is not only an issue within short stories it's an issue within the standalones. I think I had that problem with all of them apart from the heroes and because of that i have not retained very much information because a quarter of the way into the book i've already lost because there's so many characters being introduced so rapidly that now when it comes to short stories and i'm supposed to remember particular characters it's just scratching an itch in the back of my brain that makes me think that i've heard the name before but i can't for sure remember if i have or where i heard them from but at least you knew you were reading about again True. Logan, not Logan, that was the wrong series. I'm sorry. That's Alder Logan. <laughs> Sandra, are you okay? Yeah, <laughs> I'm good. Are we talking about Wheel of Time? There's a lot of characters there too. Did you just did you just see me and think we were talking about Wheel of Time for a second? Though? Yeah, I did for sure. I just assumed. We all want a map of this world, Jenny. That would be amazing. But I do not like there. fan art in the short story collection. What? Oh. My library copy anyway. I'm pretty sure that I don't have that. <laughs> oh. I have the ebook. I'm going to check this. Nope. It's not no. the best it map, is, but it exists. There is a map <laughs> that is very faintly the background, which looks like the same map. Yeah, I have that too, but it, I think it's this map basically made stand alone in my copy. It is also on the back of the cover. Like in the it means background. nothing. There's a bunch of crap all over it. I know. <laughs> I can put a picture in the Discord before yeah. I refer this to the library. <laughs> it is a struggle. And like, because I know we've said that he's like kind of subvert in a lot of common fantasy tropes and that seems to be a recurring theme. But like, he does pay, like, put a lot of detail into his books and like we've just said he kind of expects you to remember like everything that's going on but he doesn't provide any tools to help with that like he doesn't provide a map because he doesn't believe in maps and it's like if you don't believe in a world that has a map how can you create such like a well thought out developed world i wonder whether the true issue is is that he is not like a george R. R. martin like um tolkien kind of writer where you know there's the fantasy writers that create the world first and then put the story in it. I don't know if he's one of those and I don't know if that's his issue with maps. That he doesn't want to commit it to paper if he's not entirely sure that that is what the world is. And that could be, I feel like, a very valid reason for it. He definitely seems like he's like characters first and then it's like it's very easy to think that most writers are like that but he's, I think this is such a clear example compared to A Song of Ice and Fire where we had such a like a visceral understanding of what the locales looked like but we also had like some cultural nuances which played into how the characters behaved here i i just get the military men act this way military men at the union basically act like all other military men apart from the ones from the north who are just again like they're the only distinct people and I really, oh god, I re I'm i not saying it's someone's writing, and I'm totally respecting him as an author, because obviously it's really hard to write a book, but I also don't feel like the voices between the different characters feel that unique. I think he uses certain characterizations for each of our, like, narrative characters, 
Um, and it, it doesn't necessarily always work because it's meant to be like a third person limited voice, right? But then he'll have these moments of third person omniscient and it's like, that's fine. I'm all for it. But he plays so strongly into the characterizations of the character defining their narrative voice. And to me, it never works out because they always end up sounding similar. The only, like, for example, the only reason I remembered I was reading shy chapters is because she'd carry on freaking spitting out her gap tooth. Like, I didn't actually feel when I was reading her chapters that, oh, I'm reading from Shy's perspective. Does that make sense? But then he, he, he would do, like, these interesting, like, shortenings and, like, just combining of words to make it sound like certain characters had an accent. But I would find that jarring because it didn't feel as consistent. I don't know if that's... Yeah. Yeah. No, I feel you. Yeah. I definitely feel a lot of similarities between his characters. I feel like the only real characters that are very identifiable are characters like Koska, where his writing style is almost completely different for writing those characters. Um, saying that, I prefer when he has a more uniform writing style, like in the first trilogy. And I feel like in the first trilogy, it was very easy to understand who everybody was and like everybody was different. But then at this point, because he's filled it with so many side characters, those side characters are not three dimensional people. And so you can't really tell the difference between them. And like he's having to borrow the same characterizations that he's previously used, just because, as we know, a lot of these side characters are around for like a very minimal part and then they don't exist anymore. I also feel like, building off what you just said, I feel sometimes he also, because of that, he underestimates the intelligence of his readers sometimes. Like, I got it, like, three times within, like, a few paragraphs that Chev was a lesbian. I got it, okay? Mm -hmm. That, like, she clearly likes girls, oh my god, but I don't like pricks, I like girls. And then, like, the dude calls her a slur, like, I don't know, gash eater or some weird thing like that. Mm -hmm. I was like, okay, we get it she's a lesbian and then they just carry on playing into it and i was like okay okay and then later on we already know she's gay and then later on he just does another thing and it's like mm -hmm, but remember i'm not into men i like woman bits we get it we know you can just sandra, say doesn't. sandra didn't get it <laughs> sandra no. did not get it. it's okay i, I have a cool one telling you <laughs> <laughs> all your like uh what's it called like impressions best thing i ever heard of that's fair I mean, yeah. in Sandra's defense, she did read this one in five hours, so. Just beast it Which is impressive. He likes to bang us over the head with descriptions, though, because even the Glockta, like, it's a very big, massive, he was the greatest of all men, and I, over and over, and that's just kind of, he likes to do Sorry, that. he likes to describe lots of things, but not <laughs> anything that actually matters. Yeah. <laughs> oh wait, are you talking about Robert Jordan? Because <laughs> <laughs> well, we, at, least we know the characters <laughs> at least we know who the characters are, you know? Well that's true, that's true. I mean I'm struggling actually. I just started book eight in the Wheel of Time series and all of these eyes that I I no longer remember who they are. <laughs> oh yeah, but I remember the main characters in Wheel of Time. Mm. Yeah. I don't even know the main characters in this series apparently, so <laughs> <laughs> I think something that I'm finding with Joe Abercrombie and I do I do, I'm struggling now because I'm feeling kind of like not ranty but I know we're saying a lot of negative things and I do really like the first trilogy and I'm hoping that with the second trilogy we get back to that place where we're talking more about just stuff that we dislike but my impression of Joe Abercrombie right now from what everybody's spoken about in these discussions even people who are fans of him things that I've heard that he said things that he's illustrating in his stories I don't want to say that he's arrogant, but I get the feeling that he's trying to give the impression that he's some sort of like Tolkien character, like an author almost, but he is just bad at some stuff. So like, you can tell he considers world building a background thing. The map contradicts what he actually writes. Um, there's no maps in his books. These are all things that we know for sure. But Joe Abercrombie says he doesn't believe in maps. And I'm like, no, you just can't world build very well. Like, you can't world build consistently. And I feel like that's a recurring thing. Like, he subverts a lot of fantasy tropes, but does he do it on purpose? Or is he just not very good at writing those particular aspects? So he doesn't. Well, the anti-fantasy. Sorry, Deb. 
the dedication to this book is for mom and dad couldn't have done it without your genetic material. In other words, he's making himself. <laughs> so like, you gave me genetics. I worked with it. <laughs> it, it. Something about his personality in that, I think. But maybe it's just like an image. He's like trying to be this kind of like appeal to like a certain kind of audience. And it has worked because he has like really, really huge fans. I love this series. And I'm like, but why? <laughs> I think I it also do plays think... into. Sorry, go ahead, tip back off. This, this seems because like it's kind of always when we started reading the first book, and it's like okay, so like everything comes back to full circle, but why? And it's like oh, because like this isn't a fantasy story with a hero, and it's like but people like to read about that. It's okay to have a grim, dark, pessimistic, nihilistic story with a hero. You can have a morally grey hero. You can have an anti-hero. You can have a hero like the main character in Prince of Thorns. Who is he a hero? I haven't read that series like at all, but I know I've read the first chapter of the first book, and it's like this fourteen-year-old boy leading a band of like. I don't know. They're not warriors because like they're all teenagers, but they're like raping, pillaging, and murdering. But that's the main character of that story. And they're still the hero of the story. There is still a point to the story, but it doesn't have to be like a chosen one, like the Dragon Reborn kind of character. It can be somebody who's dark and jaded, who maybe isn't pursuing the right path or the good path, but like it's still a person who has a point and accomplishes things. And I just feel like he's kind of like you know the kid that I don't doesn't get enough attention or gets left out or doesn't feel like they can do anything well so they make out that the point is to not do things well I get <laughs> not that he's doing things badly it's just that was such a read that was such a read <laughs> like he's doing all these things and it's like oh yeah that's the point and I'm like but why is that the point why is that the point I completely agree I, I also think like uh, one of the comments also said like he calls himself uh, the something of Grimdark, Lord of Grimdark, but then also I've heard him like literally written as like the father of Grimdark or whatever, and I'm like, where is the dark? It's all grim, and even then, as you said, like, like he's not particular. Like, what what is the point? I, and I said this before, and I feel like I'm getting frustrated because as much as I did enjoy Robin Hobb and the world she made, sometimes I did feel like, what is the reason? Why are we going through this stuff? And I I. And maybe some people just like fucking around with characters because they don't really, um, and this is not a read, this is just me being really petty. Maybe they just like watching a bunch of characters do stuff because they don't really have anything else to do. Fair enough. But I like stories that actually have a purpose and it doesn't feel like this is serving any kind of purpose. I'm not feeling anything about like really towards empathy. I'm not always laughing all the time. There's not, I'm not always feeling shocked and like burdened by these horrible situations these character have to characters have to like go through in the world that they were raised in and them kind of combating that because none of that is happening these people are just existing in this world from one shitty thing to the next for some mediocre conclusions over and over again what's the reason <laughs> sorry joe, I joe is like, bored i feel like this if you don't try then you can't fail attitude does really sum it up because it's like if you write a completely pointless story, congratulations, you've written the best completely pointless story because everybody's writing things with a point. Like, so like, yeah, you're the best at this, but nobody's doing this for a reason. Like it's not, it's unsatisfying and that's not what you want to feel. And I feel like it kind of, I'm not saying that this is literary fantasy at all because it's not, but I feel like it mimics literary fiction in the way that it is it's creating a point instead of having a point. Like, the point is, like, that he's not like other girls. Like, the point is that they're different, they're edgy. Like, you don't have a hero or a happy ending. Everything's pointless. So why do you guys think, like, that they're so popular? Because I feel like a lot of people feel like this, but that still, like, they're, they're like... Men. <laughs> okay, hear me out. And I say, I say this with kindness... Like, majority of my friends are guys, but I say this because I feel that one thing I've definitely learned ever since we started this book club is it really does not come down to the standard of writing. 
men will always prefer reading a male author over a female author, no matter how good she is, no matter how much she doesn't like soak her books in like sex and romance or whatever the fuck. Even if she's just writing a good book, they will always have this preference towards a male author. Now, if a male author is doing something that's a bit different, he has to be the best at it. He's he's a super, super pretentious and interesting, like, no, you don't get it kind of situation. As opposed to if a woman is doing it, they're always going to spin this emotional angle. And that's also why Robin Hobb's book like appealed to them so strongly like this like a male audience as well because it was so decentralized from like those that romanticism that went and i'm not saying romanticism in like in a like a lovey-dovey affectionate way but romanticism in like a heavily deeply emotional way which is positive because it was so negative men feel like hey negative emotions we own those like th i resonate with that because i'm so like depressed and deep and blah blah, blah. and and that's why i think like that that's why it's so easy to go down this pipeline of like loving him because he's so different no you don't understand he's so dark you don't get it because it's like so deep but it's not bro like and that's why i think people love it so much because they have this idea that it's significantly deeper than it is and like men love they eat that shit up and don't get me wrong i've enjoyed some of the books but it's really taught me a lot about like male preferences when it comes to what's good or not good. So now you know what to write and then you can just pretend you're a man and then you're rich. <laughs> but actually I had a friend who read Robin Hobb and she thought that there was a man who wrote them because Robin Hobb. Yeah, yeah, that is definitely. Which I is like... Until shortly before we did the series that Robin Hobb was a woman because you just assume that she's a man. Mm. Which is obviously why she chose the pen name, I assume. And obviously why she's so popular as well, because if she mm. was a woman writing fantasy in the 90s, she wouldn't be as popular no. as she is now, if everybody knows. I, I literally have to fight men to try and get them to read um, The Priory of the Orange Tree, which to me is like my favourite standalone novel. Haven't even freaking finished it. I'm like so far in, haven't even finished it, but it's definitely the best like standalone novel I've ever read. And it's just <laughs> like, you that would appeal to like anyone who has two brain cells, and yet it's like, mm, but it's like Samantha, like shut up, bro. Just like read the damn book. It does not matter who wrote it. Like I swear to God, it's not like some shitty TikTok romance. I mean, I do kind of get it though because I don't love reading books by men unless I, <laughs> <laughs> unless I have a reason to. Like George R. R. Martin, you know, Game of Thrones. I'll read that. I know that Brendan Sanderson's good. I'll read that. Um, Joe Abercrombie was recommended. Jay Christoph. <laughs> Jay Kristoff, yeah, yeah. Although Jay Kristoff is getting in the way where like he's so hyped at the minute that he is very full of himself. Um, and I don't think Empire of the Vampire is that good, not compared to Never Night, but that's like a whole other story. But, that's one of my favorite series. Nothing is ever gonna be as good. Yeah, well, I think okay, so this is a complete tangent, but Never Night and Empire of the Vampire are exactly the same. People just like Empire of the Vampire more because it's an adult male character, because men. Um also, I think that for the people who aren't men that are only reading Empire of the Vampire because it's written by a man and the main character is a man, I think if you read Empire of the Vampire first, you like that more. If you read Nevernight first, you like that more. And that is because they're the same. So if you read Nevernight and then Empire of the Vampire as I did, he still has all the plot twists and stuff, but they're not like genius because I've already read the same kind of thing before in Nevernight. But he's getting like lots of hype and stuff because Empire of the Vampire is more popular than Never Night and he um can be a little bit full of himself. He's cool though, I like Joe Kristoff. But I also see that he is also full of himself a bit. I think it's also a pro protagonist thing. And this is where like I, I I appreciate that Joe Abercrombie has like more of a mix. Like he does definitely in these his later books, you notice that he is choosing to give more perspective characters to female characters because he is trying to like vary his worldview i think even he kind of acknowledged that it was super super narrow before maybe he felt like it had to be that like that in the beginning or maybe he's literally just changed as a writer and realized that he wasn't really giving enough power or credence to um female narratives and i respect that but i do think it's kind of frustrating how as a reader i don't think it like we we um, if I, if I, I like I, I don't know what you guys identify as but like generally as people who are femme or femme presenting they have a bit more empathy of reading different perspectives but I feel like men generally have a thing where they automatically will prefer a male perspective because they feel like oh a female perspective is so different yet in a lot of cases it's really not and like that's just that's just like where where it's like really really frustrating like the whole point of books I always thought was like in to some degree it should be a level of empathy you want 
in this new world you're like learning about this completely different surroundings and people navigating those situations you might have to be interpreting stuff you might just be taking things at face value but if there is no level of empathy happening and you're continually reading the same stories from the same male perspective from the same like i'm the hero blah 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 oh my god everything's so shit that's what your reality is going to be and that's what your worldview is going to be so like it, it, reading just starts to become a bit more pointless and like that's kind of a frustration I'm getting a lot with um, not only what we've been reading but also what you literally just said about J. Crystal because I have Empire of the Vampire I haven't read it yet mm -hmm. but I love Nevernight like that series is so good to me but that's also because like I, I liked me as a character but I didn't care as much like I like yeah she's got cool I love that that's badass but I didn't like I would have liked her no matter what she was. Yeah, it just has like it has the same writing style and the same kind of like you know what his twists are gonna be or where they're gonna come because you know what kind of twists he's done in the past. So I feel like it's just the same almost the same story, but like with a different plot setting and character. But like you can if you know Gia Kristoff, like you can kind of see what's coming, which was the downfall for me, because like everyone was like, Oh my god, it's amazing, can't believe this. And I'm like, but if you read Devonite, you could believe it. So I think the people who rated it highly and really loved it are people who haven't read Devonite, so didn't know like what was coming from him. Do do you also think this is just a general um, conversation topic? Um, do you think the first perspective character being a male also plays into the perceptions people will have when they immediately start reading a series? Because even with my book, what I'm writing right now, I'm like, okay, I start off with a female perspective, but I'm like, is that automatically going to turn off a bunch of potential readers because it's a female perspective? And I hate that thought process, but I think that it's like something you consistently notice with all the authors we've read so far, the first perspective is always going to be a guy. Mm. Oh, what's that? Oh, the first perspective in Game of Thrones is the Night's Watch, isn't it? Yeah. Wow. I feel like that's a big brain thought that I wasn't prepared for. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Just writing thoughts. Well, for the next series, you could read the, the Malazan. <laughs> oh, I don't. I've, Aaron really likes Malazan and she keeps sending me screenshots of it, but the writing style makes me want to smack my head against What's what? the first book? City of Garden of Moons or something? Garden of the Moon? I don't know if I have it. So I'm just kind of curious. Is, I, about is it Stephen Erickson? Is that his name? Somebody Erickson? I think um the way that women are, <coughs> are written is interesting. And obviously, like, because I am a woman, I'm obviously going to say this and, like, I acknowledge that. But, like, I don't have issues reading about men in books written by women the way that I have issues with the way that men write women. And... I think some of it is just pure, not necessarily, like, it is ignorance, but, like, innocent ignorance. Like, Jo Abercrombie, like, hammering in the, oh, my God, I've forgotten her name. Chef yeah. is a lesbian. Like, she's le she's lesbian. Did you know she's lesbian? It's like I was reading the third Miss Bond book by um, Brandon Sanderson, or the third, second year of Miss Bond books, like, the sixth Miss Bond book. And there's a, a woman in there called Steris and he got a lot of criticism for writing women like Vin who are like main they're essentially you know how there's arguments about women essentially just being a male main character but a woman in books so like they're the warrior type which is my preference to be fair he got a lot of criticism because Vin is very much like that so then he wrote Steris but now when you read that series it's like a man is explaining feminism to other men because Steris will sit there and she's like oh, I'm not the bravest person. I rated, I think that she is on the spectrum. And I think that's what he's trying to get across. But she'll be like, I rated everybody's usefulness out of 100 and I gave myself a seven because I'm not very useful. But then she'll do something that's like really useful, but in a non-conventional way. Like she'll, I don't know, organize something in a way that makes it, <laughs> it's not like a literal thing, but like he's showing that women can be different. Like women don't all have to be like warriors. And I'm like, this is, and people are like, yeah, like Steris gets better. And I'm like, but this is Brandon Sanderson mansplaining that women aren't all the same. Yeah. <laughs> Just like. To a degree, I feel sometimes like, I hate to say it, but sometimes it's like men have to hear it from other men and they have to have it really, really broken down for them. But the main inconvenience is if you write your men so well 
and then you write your women so poorly it's so much more jarring as an experience and it also is kind of frustrating to me because it's like another aspect of it is go outside and make friends with people who don't look like you or act like you or are the same in any way as you because then you're going to be able to more realistically right from their perspectives and also like this is also I think where an editor really doing a good job comes in because a good editor will call you out and be like actually no like you need to rethink how you've written this um because it's not feeling like you're actually right like like as you just said um it feels like these like women written as men and I don't mind that again people can be different but if all your women feel like they're written as a guy just just with a vagina you're doing something weird because even sometimes like whilst reading this the things Chev would pick out about car, whatever the frick, girl, lady, blonde oh. lady, that that one. Um, what she would like talk about is like, yes, I do think a lesbian would think that's attractive, but I also feel like if you have friends who are lesbians, you know what they talk about, like how they talk about other women, and that's why I'm just kind of like, I'm not generalizing all lesbians. Obviously, people are different, but I'm just like it feels like what a man would notice about a woman that he's attracted to as opposed to what a woman would notice about a girl she's attracted to. You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. Especially because Chev is not a, a very masculine woman in her mannerisms. She's not, I would say that Karkov is more feminine in looks, but I would say that Chev is almost more feminine emotionally. So I feel like for her to talk about Kharkov in that way is actually very like male gazy, which I didn't notice until you pointed it out. But yeah, like you definitely have a point there. Oh my god, her hips. Oh my god, like, you don't get it. Wait, her hips. Maybe. Her hips is perfect for childbearing. No, I'm joking. <laughs> With what children? <laughs> They're rubbing their gashes against Oh people. no. <laughs> Why? Also, like, I, I get in this world, it makes sense to call it that. I get people would be that nasty, but for the love of Christ, I want never to like. <laughs> it's fine. I get it. It works in a groom dark world. I never want to read that again. That makes me feel sick. And like, people complain about velvet sheathed steel, and I'm like, how can you complain about that when there's gash in the world? <laughs> <laughs> the gash <laughs> sounds like I, a wound. I will also say, like, what is this is totally going on a different tangent what is wrong with the word cock like just say that why must we why must we make poetic circles around it i don't want to be oh, impaled I... <laughs> I don't get it that's very fair um does anybody in the chat have any questions about sharp ends and does anybody have any passing thoughts on sharp ends I am just glad that it's over. And I'm, I'm a still, even after all of this complaining about, on my part, the standalones and the short story collection, I'm really excited to start the next trilogy. But that's I'm all also kind of excited. Yeah. Because, like, I feel like the trilogy, I like that more than whatever I've been reading. Apparently, I haven't been retaining yeah. anything anyway. <laughs> but that's that's not, I blame Amber Crombie here. But so, like, I feel like maybe a full trilogy will, like, pick me up and then I will be disappointed in the end. Especially well, because a fresh start, you, you can actually start paying attention with the next book. <laughs> I know somebody yes, said I? This, is, this is way back, so I didn't um, catch it, but somebody said, like, do we think Logan's going to turn up in the next trilogy because um, he's getting on because of how long after the original trilogy it is? And, like, I get that, but what's the point? I mean, what's the point is what we always say about these books but what would be the point of him getting up and lead it, leave it and going back north if we were never going to see him again uh, I feel like he is going to turn up and I won't notice I also don't understand what is like as you said what is his purpose he has no wife he has no kids everyone up there hates him uh, the Union and Bethel are going through some shit like bro like the next few books are most likely just going to be Union is doing this Monza is fucking over the Union Bethel very sad mm, stoic okay like Beth now what dead, though, isn't he? is Where? he dead? He's dead. <laughs> lol <laughs> my brain has not retained that information <laughs> no Bethel was actually dead because Logan was the king of the not the, the, is that what they call him in this or am I going Game of Thrones you're going Game of Thrones. No, that you're going Game of Thrones. <laughs> yeah. Well, we'll call them that anyway, because it's essentially the same thing. Um, so Logan was the king in the north, 
and then he was killed by Black Doe, who was the king in the north, because Beth is dead. But I thought Black Doe was his friend. Whose friend? He was everyone's friend, but they're all everybody's friends until they stab. Isn't Dogman currently the leader of everything because Three Trees died? Three so Trees died, but died. I don't know whether he's now taken over Black Dow or whether he is the leader of. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. he did. Just he did die. Group. But now that's I remember Three Trees dying, and then they nominated Dogman as like the next big thing. But I don't understand. I don't even know what's happening. We spent so much time in the north, and like my brain is just like okay. So but, I remember that Beth had died at the end of the first trilogy, and I'm sure it was Black Doe was the leader, and he's horrible because he was the one that was raping everyone in the trilogy. Yeah, 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 yeah. he's awful. Um, Dogman uh, is with the Union, and Black Doe is the king of the North. Okay. Yeah, Dogman's the leader of the Northmen for the Union. Oh, Black and Black. then um, Scale died in Heroes, and I think Calder took over from his yeah. father, which is Beth Odd, and Calder is now trying to unite the North in peace, like his father was. Because his brother died, but then his brother came back. Oh, his brother is the leader, but he is the leader. Like, his brother's the face, and yeah. he's the right? Yeah, so, cool. And scale. It, it, is Glockta dead? Glockta's alive, and no, Glockta alive. is running the union with Jezal as a puppet king. So we, and yeah, I guess that's what I thought, but I, was, I just needed to make sure. Because who knows? And Monza's making moves to undermine Glockta. Oh, so Calder is now the king, Block Black Doe is dead. Yeah. So Calder is the king and he wants to unite the world in peace. Actually, thinking about the end of this, the last story, it was interesting to see him Bethard from a different angle because Logan hates him. Mm. So we always see that as like the North and like Bethard are a bad thing, you know, you know, all of the Northmen, but he's actually a, he's decent, he's all right. He was dropping so many bars. Like, yeah. A great man does this. A great man does this. And a part of me is like, is this Joe Abercrombie trying to like have some really good quotable moments? <laughs> and he just shoved them all at the end? Or is it literally like, the, the way then, the other way I was interpreting it was like, I think it might be both things. So one, he's trying to be like, oh my God, look at me. I've got so many good quotes. I'm much wise. And then another part of me was like, this is Bethel consistently reinforcing to himself what he should be like as the king. And so he says it to other people. So he, they see him that way, but he's clearly somewhat insecure about his place as pink, as pink, as king, because when he goes to see Logan, you could see how like, he was terrified. Like he was scared and he was so frustrated. Mm. And so like that really showed that he as much power as he wants to have over people he does not have as much power as he wished he did and i also like that it showed dogman being kind of like useless and i love him but like kind of useless in the sense that he could not stop logan not only does that show how kind of they had a weird relationship he always like had respect for logan but he because like remember when bethod says oh i don't want him to do something stupid and then he's like he's not stupid and he's like okay well something that i want him to do basically and then he still does anyway it really kind of shows that they didn't have a, much of a backbone when it comes to Logan because he's just such a reprehensible person mm. as to how he used to be. I will say, I the best thing that this guy has written is just Logan as a character. I just love everything that's happened to this man. And if he if he takes it into another level, into another realm, I'll be incredibly impressed. I, I, honestly, if somehow he ends up being the king and reuniting everything in some weird, peaceful way, I would be like, that is so jarring, but I love it. But knowing him, he's probably going to make him die uselessly in a ditch or just, like, never talk about him again. So from what I can tell here, we have Jizal as the king with Glock to rule in, Skills the king with Cal to rule in, and then we have Monza. But then we also have Bayaz and what's the guy called in the south? What's he? It's not Yusuf. Yusuf was friends with Bayaz, right? He worked for the bank, didn't he? Oh, maybe. <laughs> Wait, was it was the bank under buyers as well? Because I think the one thing we consistently kept seeing is how the people from the bank would show up. Yes, but then in the last shots, in the last standalone, we saw the people turn up for the other guy, the prophet. Mm -hmm. um, but then the bank was still there. But Baez is in control of the bank, and Baez is in control of everything apart from assumedly Monza. Yeah, because he tried to, and then Monza was like, "Absolutely effing not! If you come back, I'm gonna." Ooh. Well, I'm, the 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 next book, the next series is about their kids, so I I don't know what the 
relevance that's going to have to the fact that everything has been maneuvering Baez in control of everything apart from Monza that has to be relevant but how relevant is that going to be with the kids taking control of the story does she even want anymore she has all the power that she she wanted I don't know people's desires can change and I respect her, but I guess because we're not actually in her head I don't really get what her intentions are I think Monza yeah, Monza is just defending herself now because Baez wanted her to come into the union and she wouldn't. So. <clears throat> cool. So I, I remember. Actually. Wait. Uh... Khalil is the other guy, the, the bad guy, but I think Baez, I think they're all bad. All bad, for sure. <laughs> I just find all of these people awful and I get it it's like big people playing on a big chessboard making players against each other and then we carry on having this thing reinforced to us about how that affects the smaller people around them but I'm like what's the reason like what's the point <laughs> is this series over after this trilogy is that it is it done yes but he hasn't as far as I'm aware, he's not writing anything new right now, but he hasn't definitively said that it's over. So Is he writing well, a different series <clears throat> currently? Please, please. Let I think he's writing something else right now okay. that isn't related to this, but he's never said that this is finished, although he's never said that he has any intentions to write anything else either. It looks like there's a novella after the third book, because there's technically something called number 11, but it's only 77 pages oh, okay. in the first law. A whole lot show for that. <laughs> maybe we'll just um, we'll see what it's about, and if it is relevant, we'll maybe tack it onto the last live show with the rest. <laughs> well, he released another short story collection last year. Yeah. Love that. There's room for more if he wants to. He probably wants to. He's pretty ready, I think. <laughs> He's always ready. You just Someone need to think out some semblance of the plot. What? Someone in the chat said that the Half a King series is so much better, and I have, have actually heard really good things about that. It's a YA, but apparently a really good one. I heard it was terrible, but that's just... Oh, really? <laughs> yeah, people... Is, I heard that people was like, oh my god, it's like just a typical YA. It's... Oh. Nothing I heard like. things about it. <laughs> yeah. Or like, it's probably young, or like, not complex, etc. So. Oh, it's awful. Okay. Okay. Oh. Well, I mean... Now that I'm hearing mixed things, I probably won't read it after this. I would probably continue to read First Law books as they're released, if so. But um, I love how we keep saying as well for Catch Up Book Club, it's like, yeah, when the next book in a series is released, like we'll get together and we'll read it. And nothing, not a single series has had a new installment. What is George doing? I need to speak to this man. I need him to like finish his goddamn He's book. like, he's like doing a billion other project that is not a song is as a fire and don't get me wrong i respect it because he he wrote the story for elden ring and the dlc is coming out in june go off king he did pop off because that was game of the year and that was a massive cultural moment and it wouldn't have happened without his story and world building but also the audacity of this man to be helping make a whole ass <laughs> game and yet and house of the dragon is he, is he working on the john snow Spin off to Game of Thrones. Don't, don't even get me started. Don't even. You know how much I love that series. Don't even get me started right now. <laughs> and then, you know, like, he's doing Fire. He, he wrote Fire and Blood, but not the second one. And then he yeah. did House of the Dragon. House and of the, the Dragon, Fire... I think, is the first half on... of Fire and Blood. Yeah, yeah, it's based on Fire and Blood. So, so like got more. There's still more book, but the Jon Snow spin off is going to be completely outside of books. So, like, is he yeah. working on the story for that, or is that are they doing that themselves? Because they're doing that themselves, it's going to be terrible. Like, the I think I heard of... someone say that like. It was like, what's his calling it? Kit Harrington's team is working on it. But that's just me. One one thing that stresses me out the most about that entire situation. Oh my god, I really... I don't know. Okay, y'all didn't know me back then. This was years ago when the final episode came out. I was literally uploading videos of me bawling my eyes out when the series ended. Because it, it was actually such pain for me. Like, you need to understand. That was one of my favorite series ever. I like the books. And then I was like, this is the... This? <laughs> but it's not even an ending because you know Daenerys is going to get revived. That's why her dragon is taking her to the east. What is the point? Just spoil what was the point? Thrones, Just go for it. I don't care. I don't care. You've had enough like time now. But wait, point. didn't we know you in t like it only ended in 2019? Have yeah, you yeah. been here for a hundred years? <laughs> wow. Wow. 
That's, that's like so y'all don't know me, and everyone's like, "Yeah, no, we do." Because <laughs> here's the thing: I like because part- I look. I love Game of Thrones with all my heart. Like it was my favorite thing in the whole world. That last episode aired on my birthday. No, oh, it was the worst birthday I ever had. No, I'm joking. That was a bit dramatic, but I was <laughs> like, <laughs> What? <laughs> to be honest, you have a was... lot of terrible birthdays. No, I'm yeah. joking. But I, it was cozy after that, but I was like, ruin my mood the whole day because I was like, what is this shit? I spent all my years doing what? Um, I, f- I just looked at like what the reviews, like general reviews look like for the third book in this final trilogy. I'm yeah. not reading them. I'm just looking at the number. And like, obviously, generally people fall off as the series continues. Like they might just DNF. They might not be interested. How And so like the most loyal fans are going to stick to something. But interestingly, the final book in Age of Madness has a 4.6 out of 5 mm-hmm. out of 26,000 reviews. Like that's actually really impressive. As an average, so that I have means to... that it's at least consistent because I have seen a few series recently where the last book is rated a lot lower than the first one, and I'm like, Dang. yeah. And and it seems like even even the second book is at like over thirty thousand ratings. That's also a four point six. Like, it's clearly this final trilogy is doing something right for a lot of people who've stuck around this far. But um, some people will read it as a trilogy. Yeah. And so, there's the like, stars one in boost of finishing. <laughs> Five stars. <laughs> Some people um won't have read all. I'm 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 looking at the ones that are for the each specific book on Goodreads general review as opposed to like the trilogy review. Mm-hmm. And that's where I'm saying like even the second book having such a good rating as this as the third book in that Age of Madness trilogy. Oh, that what's is the imp- second? what's the rating on the second book? Four point six as well with over thirty thousand reviews. Oh, yeah. That's the that's the fanboys hanging on. That's why they're rating it so highly. That girl you listen <laughs> I'm <laughs> trying to have hope right now. <laughs> We're getting a part, for the excitement. A, I always it's like I love talking about books and stuff like that. So it's like that's why I, I I love being on this platform. I'm so grateful for Becca, but also I am trying to have hope right now that it's like actually a point. Um as opposed to reading like dreading book <laughs> four point four five. Which one? Book one has a four point four five of that trilogy. That's also good. I did see someone say that you could go into the last trilogy without having any of the backstory, which I guess for those of us who have missed things in the first missed all seven oh. books, <laughs> that's a good sign. Well, I think that's also what people have said about like even the standalones. Like I remember Becca had mentioned this previously in one of our live shows that like a lot of people had said that you can go into the standalones and just read them or like start from them. But without the context that you get from the prior trilogy, you yeah. would not be able to know like any of these characters. What does it mean? Again, like picking up on Logan being Logan. Logan, if you hadn't read the original trilogy, you would not be able to retain that. Like, that, but you that just want to retain it anyway, so because you probably read better books. I don't know, man. <laughs> no, but I was going to say, did you see that there was going to be an adaption of First Law, but they're starting with one of the standalones? Oh, really? Mm. Oh, so is they're it not the... like how they did the Grishaverse where they did Six of Crows integrated with the No, Grisha. they're like literally just doing one of the standalones before doing the original trilogy. I don't I mean, know which like one. Soft launch. So they're like, if it, because if they do a standalone, they can do a mini series, but they don't want to start first law and then not continue if he does badly. Maybe mm. I don't remember exactly, but uh, I was I thought it was interesting way to like start it. Okay, if it actually gets adapted, I feel validated because of the three standalones, the lowest rate is best served cold. I don't That's care. Has a four point two. <laughs> And the well, other two have like four points. Y- y'all don't play Assassin's Creed enough for me to be able to understand why it's a good book. <laughs> okay. And out of all of them, the short stories is the lowest rated. <laughs> oh, <it> makes sense. <laughs> That's fast. Still over a four, but it is the lowest. <laughs> I feel like this video game info is more things you have in common. So I feel like we need to talk about this afterwards. <laughs> right. I think that that is all we have to say about oh the lowest rated sound is getting a film tea. Oh, I'm, I'm literally um 
Oh my god, yes. Thank you, books and chocoholic. Thank you for under <laughs> honestly. That's also like Assassin's Creed is why I love Nevernight so much because it's giving Assassin's Creed the list, the Italian vibes. And Jay Crystal validated me because he did a video recently with the guy who plays Klaus, um, and he used the Assassin's Creed soundtrack in the background. Please Klaus, I mean, Klaus from Vampire Diaries. Yes. It was it was something for the um, the Empire of the Vampire or whatever. So I've read it. But oh, like, he read um he read Empire of the Vampire and like was like obsessed with it and was tweeting Jay Kristoff, which is why they did that thing. Together. No, yeah. sorry. <laughs> no, but I, I love I love Assassin's Creed. I I just love a kill list. I love a kill list, and then I love pe seeing people go on that journey. I love books that feel like games, and I think that's why I enjoyed that so much because it felt like a game situation. Them going from one place to another, figuring out these interesting ways to actually like. It's quote unquote assassinate um, each of the different targets. It was just like that was just so so good to me. Um, the updated schedule is just going to be one book every two months from now. So it will be what month are we now? May, July, and August, and then we're done. Hasn't it always been one book every two months? Um, this one should have been one month, but that would have meant that uh, we synced up with Wheel of Time, oh. and I quite enjoy not wanting to die. So. <laughs> uh, it's all my fault. September. <laughs> August or um, September is the last one short enough we're doing in one month. What what? August or is it September? Two months. July and August would be one month. Yeah, it's September. <laughs> and like what a month? I don't know. <laughs> What's happening? Is that when the final will you read the final one? Yeah, September. We always seem to finish in September. And Why we'll do you start. always, always in my birthday month, man? You always like well, do this to me. It's gonna oh, be well, five months. You, so it'll be a good thing. Oh wait, Look, shit. Yeah. <laughs> my birthday month is May, so the next one's in my birthday month, and then the next one falls the month that I go to San Diego, and then the final one's in your birthday. This month. is your cage that you created. Excuse me for not having sympathy. <laughs> Actually, no, I didn't. I didn't put myself in a cage. I like put myself in a nice little box, and then Sandra came along and put iron <laughs> bars around it when she signed me up for Wheel of Time. <laughs> Actually, I said, "Do you want to do Wheel of Time?" And you were like. No. <laughs> no, you said, does it matter to catch a book club? Because I wanted to do one every month, but you were like... And I was, I was like, like, well, if we do every second month, would you not do a catch a book club? That I'm very like, okay. glad you didn't do every month. Those books are big. <laughs> Sandra would have been doing it by herself. <laughs> yeah, I didn't want it to take, like, uh, two and a half years, but here we are. Well, here we are. It should be done before autumn, and then, as usual, we'll be on break until January when we'll start. Something, something, Woo! something. Malazan, just... Malazan, Mal. <laughs> no, I'm not doing Malazan. <laughs> can we do something that's like actually like I I say this like can we do something that's like not men like I like with love with love with we love. did I women last it. time. Okay, I'm sorry, but that didn't count. Like I want like I don't know. <laughs> can we can we just do? Can we just, okay, okay, okay. Here's, here's my one condition. Can we do a series that has a point? Well, maybe, but how do we know it has a point unless we read it? Well, are you saying the end of of um? I'll, I don't know. I don't know. I'll Does not have a point. I haven't read the last box. Uh, I'm not gonna comment. See, I, this I, is where Zaf's like he all didn't know me then, but Faye's over here like name dropping the Le Guin along, which we all like to pretend doesn't exist. Yeah, I so, love like, Ertzi. Faye's been around a long time. I've never read that. I have it, but I haven't it's read it. not good, and we're not reading it. it was I love it. Don't listen to them. Don't listen to them. <laughs> I don't know. I'm not listening to my bio. twin. Like she, we been... got a lot going on. Like maybe we, we are twins now. We're getting <sighs> yeah right. <laughs> I am getting a lot of questions actually about what we're doing next and I'm like calm down in January people were like what is the next series and I'm like we still have an entire year like please don't talk to me I, want, mm -hmm. I need to know what I'm buying Becca <laughs> I, I, I have a long list guys I'll I'm do sorry. what I normally do at the end of the last live show I'll tell you what we're reading and then I'll film the actual announcement in December but y'all can have like advance warning Hey, I'm just, I'm just standing there to bring the books. December. I can't think of any other series. Like, I, oh god, th don't treat this like a challenge. I can't think of any other series that are really, really long, though. Like, other than Wheel of Time, off the top of my head. Um, so the only ones that be. I know are too long that I really don't want to do, like the Rift, Rift War Saga by 
is it Raymond D. Feist? And then Jenny Wurtz as well also has a really long series. That's a woman, I think. Um, but her series is also very long. And I know that she co-writes with Raymond D. Feist. So, like, there's also, I think, points where they intersect. Uh, or is it Jenny Wurtz that does the Riff War saga? And then, I don't Question, know. Is, is Malazan the one where in the final book, like, in one of the printings, it's, like, this really bad, like, demon dude? Like it, the art is really bad, and it's like a demon makeup on some guy. Or am I thinking of a complete other series? I could not tell you. Okay, I'm gonna look it up because I know that's also a series that like everyone's like, oh my god, like it's so so good. Maybe someone knows what I'm talking about. Help. <laughs> so the War of Light and Shadow is twenty works with eleven primary works. Uh, do 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 you do those every month then? What? Do you ever do the club every month? Um, only if the books are short. But they are never short. It's high fancy. <laughs> well, yeah, <laughs> that is true. Malazan is ten books. We have already done a uh, bond season. Bond season has been done. Oh, I haven't read that. But... We haven't done bond season, but I have been part of a bond season read along, so I can't really do bond season again. <laughs> Mercedes are series where there needs to be another um, book. Mercedes Lackey has been flagged for transphobia. FYI. And McCaffrey I'm concerned about because of how old the books are. Michael J. Sullivan I'm interested in because Timothy Gerard Reynolds narrates the audiobooks. He's the same audiobook narrator as Red Rising. You should pick those. One of Cass, um, Cass's favourite series as well. Uh, Catherine Kerr, possible. Temera, I feel like that has potential to go really badly because Naomi Novik is so hit and miss. I really like the first one, but that's just me. It's basically like war, but with dragons. As I've said, no men. No, I have no issues reading something by a man. As you literally as like, like, just said no men. <laughs> yeah, I said like I would prefer though. I don't actually know what I said. I'm rewriting history, so I would. I'm, I, I'm, I'm gonna pull a Sarah J. Mass and gaslight you into like and like rewrite the reality of what the past was, just so you think differently now. No, I didn't say I didn't want any men. I just said that I wanted like good female perspectives. Um, I it's not like you can rewind. It, it, this isn't recorded. Well, anymore. she can, so I'm going to pretend <laughs> I can right now. I <laughs> Cassandra, have... clear! Sorry. I, I am been... trash. Oh my god. <laughs> I'm in. I have been oh. thinking about Trudy Canavan, but the only person that I've heard actually read Trudy Canavan is somebody that I went to uni with, so they're not a book person, so I don't know like what the general consensus of Trudy Canavan is. Because like I don't want to start something and be like, this is the most problematic author that ever existed. Cassandra, no, we're not doing Cassandra Clare. Absolutely never. Disappointing. <laughs> that would be I quite would be in. from Abercrombie. <laughs> you know, at least there is a point. There's drama. There is better sex scenes. There is <laughs> incest. Stop. There is I know as I've said no men, but apparently she never said that. John Gwynn. I could get behind this. I feel, okay, what did he write? The Faithful and the Fall, and the first one is Malice. Mm -hmm. And then oh! there's also a spin-off to The Faithful and the Fall. That's the, that's a full book series, right? Like, the ones with the, the weapons on the covers? Yes, like axes. I, okay, okay, so I actually literally have all four books, so that would be perfect. And then there's a spin-off trilogy, so it's seven in total, I think. Fuck I think me. it's a spin-off. <sighs> I, I was so excited, thinking it was something that was like... A quartet and a trilogy, yeah. Um, okay, it doesn't have to be a long series necessarily, but we do kind of specialize generally in extended universes, um, which means we should. We were going to read Fire and Blood actually, but then we were so like demotivated after watching season after season eight finished <laughs> that we just didn't go circle back around to Fire and Blood. Um, <laughs> so yeah, we tend to do stuff that's difficult to read because it's so long that you kind of lose momentum. So anything that kind of has multiple series. That like. And why did you never do Wheel of Time? Because um, we were going to, that was a suggestion, but Cody had already started it and wasn't loving it, and she picked First Law. But Cody's not here, is she? No. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. 
sorry. I'm sorry, Cody. <laughs> I do actually think John Wayne could be a good show. Um, or if I can find somebody who goes hard for Trudy Canavan, that like, because like obviously with Realm of the Oddlings, I'd heard multiple people say it was really good, and like people in the book club had read like some of the first books, and the same for First Law, like people had read the first book and said like it would be something that we'd like to read but i've literally heard nobody on booktube talk about trudy canavan so i don't know what like people think about her in general and i don't want to do like some obscure fantasy series that turns out to be a massive flop <laughs> so. I, I would i would actually really really be down for the whole john Gwynn thing also because uh, he has that series out now um the blood sworn saga which is so so intriguing Shadow of the Gods. That one. Yeah, yeah that that yeah that one and then the hunger of the gods is out and like i'm just so intrigued by that series it's giving like i don't know the whole vibe of it is. Mm. I read Shadow of the Gods and I read a whole <coughs> first like Faithful on the Fallen Portrait and I have not liked any of them. <laughs> but don't listen to me. I can still talk. What the Trudy Canavan is? I'm sure Trudy Canavan is a trilogy, two trilogies and a prequel. He thinks it did a Black Magician trilogy. Yeah, but I feel like I heard people talk about it before. I just don't know when. Because there's the Black Magician trilogy, and then I definitely have the prequel and the first book of the first series, and then there's also, is it the Traitor Spy trilogy? Is the second part? Does anybody know? Yeah, it seems like it. The Courtney Goodrich is a sequel series, the Traitor Spy trilogy. Oh, prequel series, the Black Magician. Yeah, so that would be seven books because it would be the prequel and two trilogies. But and wouldn't then... it be kind of fun to read something like less, less known? um yes but it's just because i am committed to it i don't want to end up reading something that's less known which means that we don't know if people generally like it and that it turns out being horrible true so that's why it's because it's a big risk committing to like a big series um if we're not sure i think you should read vampire academy and <laughs> i've read vampire academy and bloodlines i don't think uh, i'll ever reread them so i think i would hate them now <laughs> i really want to do a read along off it but i'm like who who do i ask who's gonna join me in that huh no one you know zodiac academy i really want to read that but i also think it doesn't match the tone of the book club because obviously this is like oh like long series or just like a, a heavy series that a lot of people haven't had the opportunity to read and then like we're literally catching up on this series but um i know that's like dare i say trayish but like i'm intrigued because i love entertaining trash like to split up like actual books. Um, <laughs> wow. I'm sorry. I started I'm not... Barbarian Snacks. Come on. <laughs> I feel like this could be a solid, actually. Malice. And then maybe I'll do some research on Black Magician. Because realistically, we could squeeze like a seven book series into a year. Do you hate me? Yeah. I thought so. You're, you're always okay. trying to read more, so maybe you should. I, I can pick up the slack. It's okay. <laughs> I can pick up the slack. <laughs> Sandra came in and was like, "I just read this. I remember nothing. I want to be a full member of this club." <laughs> yeah, I'm here for vibes. <laughs> I'm here for vibes. <laughs> I've heard good things about Johnny Worst. I feel like I would once again need to seek out some hardcore reviews of Johnny Worst because they're kind of old and kind of long. So I don't want them to be super problematic and also like long-winded and laggy. Oh, Brandy Sandy, though. Brandon Sanderson has been discussed because Zaf wants to do it, but nobody else does because we've already read most of the Cosmere and don't want to reread it. I want to reread. <laughs> Thank you, Sandra. Well, Make when it. Sandra's done with Wheel of Time, you can join Sandra's book club as well and do Brandon Sanderson with Sandra. Here's oh my thing, god, it, it seems digestible. Uh, yeah, you could call. You could call your Brandy Sandy read along Brandy with Sandy. <laughs> <laughs> Well, now she you cooked. have to do it. She cooked. But with who? With me, myself alone. Yeah, you can do it as like a talk show and then act out. I, the I will make him come in. <laughs> Brandy wow. with Sandy. But then he should be there. So it's Brandy with Sandy. That's true. That's true. Ask Daniel Green to hook you up. Yeah, I talk to him every day. So I would just like be, hey, bro. <laughs> <laughs> we read books. <laughs> bro. 
Right. I think we're derailing the conversation now. So we'll see you all in May. But thank you to everybody who's joined us today. <laughs> I'm glad that we've um, entertained you, even if the discussion of this book wasn't the best one that we've ever had. We have not talked about this book for the past half hour. Let's be real. <laughs> that's true. That's true. I mean, we've been dipping in and out a little bit up until I'd say the last 15 minutes we fully derailed. 15 minutes how, is like how all of these end, right? <laughs> Supposed to be. If, if I don't ramble and get annoyed about Game of Thrones in one of these, then you know it's not. Like, I'm just not present. I have to always complain about something that's not related to the book and it's always related to George R. R. Martin. I hope I meet him one day, but I hope he doesn't hate me. <laughs> well, and on that note, we'll see you all in May. Thank you very much for joining us and thank you to my wonderful hosts. And I'll see you all soon.